A couple of thoughts uh, before we look at the story that we heard from Luke this morning. In biblical scholarship, there is something called the synoptic problem, which really isn't a problem at all, but it's kind of a curiosity. Basically, the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all took pretty much alike, all look pretty much alike with the same or similar stories. But one does wonder how various parts of Jesus' life can be recorded dissimilarly in some instances. It's well believed that Mark was the first gospel out of the gates, and then Matthew and Luke followed with their works 15 to 20, maybe 25 years later. It's further believed that Matthew and Luke wrote their gospels copying Mark, but they also added some special materials. Matthew's was labeled M by scholars, and Luke's L, which admittedly is not really imaginative when you think about it. But one of those stories from L that's not found anywhere else in the scripture concerns this account of the miraculous catch of fish that we heard about. The only other thing similar to it is a post-resurrection story in the gospel according to John. Following Jesus' rising from the dead, he directed their disciples to toss the nets to the right side of the boat. And as a result, they pulled in a catch of 153 fish, causing the same biblical scholars to go just nuts trying to figure out what is the significance of the number 153. Was it the known number of fish? Was it a special number that early Gnostic Christians who dabbled in secret stuff uh, thought had special meaning? Was it representative of all the different types of the people indicating everybody being drawn in? Or did they just actually catch 153 fish? And they would have known that because they had to divide them up to take them to market. Now, just a little background on Simon, Simon Peter, hereafter known as Simon in this story, since he's a key player in all this. In Luke, we hear his name first when Jesus entered his house and cured his mother-in-law of a fever. The second occasion was when Jesus hopped into his boat and taught people lined up on the shore. So Simon does have some immediate history with Jesus, but I'm guessing that he still was very much puzzled by our Lord's nature. So, now back to the story. Jesus was standing beside the Lake of Gennesaret, which is just another name for the Sea of Galilee. And people were eager for his teaching. And so to get far enough away to keep the mob at a distance, he put off from the shore in Simon's boat. And in Matthew and Mark, he does the same thing. He teaches from a boat. Following his speaking, he told Simon to head out to the deep and put down the nets, something the soon-to-be disciple thought futile, as they had worked all throughout the night and they had caught nothing. But along with his partners, he did what Jesus asked them to do. And lo and behold, they caught this tremendous number of fish, such a catch that the others had to come and help haul them all in. Now, if you think about it, at least three thoughts can rise out of the story that seem somewhat important. The first obvious thing is that there were a bunch of fish caught, so many as to cause the fishermen, Simon Peter and his friends, to be afraid both boats would sink when all those fish were brought on board. Simply said, the number of fish drawn in by our Lord's invitation as to where to toss the nets was beyond manageability. It was beyond their control. We're not built for this kind of abundance, they might have thought in so many words. After all, they were used to operating with smaller expectations and smaller results. And those boats which were built to handle those smaller expectations, shaped by past experiences, were starting to sink because of the overwhelming, shall we say, blessings that had come their way were more than they could handle. And I find that intriguing, enough so that I wonder how often the same thought occurs in our lives as were voiced by Simon Peter and company. Are we ever actually derailed by the superfluity of God's grace that it threatens to sink our expectations as to how we are to function day by day? 
Related to this is our operating, of course, out of the fear of scarcity. We perhaps think we can't do what we're called to do because we're just not capable on occasion of believing that we have enough moxie to pull it off. Now, I think every one of us probably at one time or another falls into that trap. And then we do a capital funds drive here to build a larger church and our fear that we might not get enough towards our goal is blown away by the observable fact that we got more than we anticipated receiving. The net was more full than we realistically imagined it could be. Isn't it wonderful that such things happen on occasion to help us break through to a new way of appreciating the presence of Christ in our lives. A second thing that strikes me as startling is that of Simon Peter's reaction to the catch. Instead of yelling, holy mackerel, look at that, <laughs> notwithstanding the fact that mackerel actually are not found in the Sea of Galilee, he immediately cried out this. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Really? I'm betting Jesus may very well have already known that, <laughs> that Simon was indeed a sinful man caught up in a state of separation and alienation from himself, from his fellows, and from his God. Simon, after all, was just another of the ordinary folks to whom Jesus would be preaching and visiting for the rest of his life. He was one of those captive, poor, oppressed, and blind, the very folks who would be the object of that affection and love that he had. So it really isn't amazing at all to think that Jesus would appear in generosity, a theme of the season of Epiphany, to a sinner or a nobody like Simon. He had advertised that this is where he was heading all along. To such would be given so much that they could hardly handle it. And then for a third thought, and I think this is actually pretty important. Jesus took Simon as well as James and John with him. And what I find quite noteworthy is that prior to taking these three, our Lord did not look at him and say, you bums better shape up. Didn't say that at all. It was as if he simply pronounced them worthy enough for the cause and then took them as they were. And rather than mandating their changing their behavior from whatever it was to something new, he just gathered them into the fold and began to walk together with them into new life then and there. Last Thursday was my 38th anniversary of being ordained a priest. I'd been ordained a deacon six and a half months prior. And I must say, that on both nights of those ordinations, I distinctly do remember if indeed I was up, up to it. If I believed sufficiently. And if I really, 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 really had been called. In the examination of me, Bishop Charles, after describing the work of a priest, asked, My brother, do you believe that you are truly called by God and his church to this priesthood? And the prayer book prescribed me to say, I believe I am so called. But if the truth be told, I could not help but wonder if that was indeed true. How often do all of us wonder if we're good enough? More remarkably, how often do we raise that question even though God seems not to be giving our worthiness a second thought? ever. It's all quite amazing, isn't it? Not unlike a catch of fish exceeding our expectations, we are given far more than we anticipate coming our way. We are loved more than we think that we deserve, given our finitude, and we are called into a ministry despite the fact that we wonder sometimes whether or not we are fit for the job. Needless to say, this is not the way the world works. All those job search websites that advertise about every six minutes on television and satellite radio would look at Jesus' manner of picking disciples as stupidly foolhardy. But this is the way that a gracious God functions, enabling us to be so enfolded 
into the love of Christ, the fellowship of his body, and the activity of his ministry. Now, wouldn't it just be terrific if in a world in which so many really never think this way could conceive out there of our Lord's favor that together, simply with Jesus, we do have what it takes to bring about decency and kindness and freedom from want and also joy. After all, what we do around here in the company of one another is exactly that ministry which, quite miraculously, has become for us business as usual. And for that, we most certainly can be thankful. Amen.